This episode of the Troxel Podcast is made possible with support from Arc IT. Are you tired of standard IT services that miss the mark? Choose Arc IT for specialized, proactive IT management, BIM support, and robust data security tailored for architects. Whether you're a team of 10 or a growing firm of 50 plus, Arc IT understands the architecture industry and will empower your unique creative vision to enable you to do your best work. Embrace a technology team that enhances, not hinders, your design process. Visit getarcit.com for your free IT assessment and start transforming your firm and your tech experience today. That's G-E-T-A-R-C-H-I-T dot com. Welcome to the Troxel Podcast. I'm Evan Troxel. In this episode, I welcome Shane Berger back to the podcast. Shane is an internationally recognized leader in the advanced use of technology in design and experience for the built environment. And as a principal at Woods Bagot, he directs a vision centered on technical innovation and leads a global team dedicated to researching, developing, and applying new models of design and delivery to projects. He has lectured widely on a range of topics, including design computation, BIM, digital fabrication, building performance, VR and AR, smart buildings, and digital culture and experience. Starting in the early 2000s, he was an early advocate and active developer of design computation methodologies in the AEC industry. During that time, his built work at Grimshaw Architects focused on the design of arts and cultural institutions and used an array of computational processes to synthesize geometry, analysis, and material fabrication. He also served for eight years as a director of the design, computation, and education nonprofit Smart Geometry, firmly positioning it at the intersection of art, design, technology, and the modern human experience. At Smart Geometry, he promoted the emergence of a new paradigm for digital designers and craftsmen where mathematics and algorithms are as natural as pen and paper. In this episode, you'll hear that before I had the chance to formally welcome Shane back to the show, we were chatting about what we were going to talk about, and it was so good, I just had to leave it in. So the setup here for Shane's launching point is a tweet thread he posted about software licensing models in AEC, which I've linked to in the show notes. So anyway, if you're wondering why it sounds like I didn't welcome him to the show like I usually do with my guests, now you are prepared for the cold open. Today we talk about current and potential future impacts of AI and automation on architectural practice, the shift from perpetual to per-user licensing in AEC project delivery software, license management difficulties, enhancing productivity and improving project delivery while maintaining a human-centric approach, reevaluating business models towards valuing outcomes and performance, rethinking workflows, balancing technological advancements and the essence of human intelligence and empathy, and more. This, once again, was a fantastic conversation with Shane, and I hope you'll not only find value in it for yourself, but that you'll help add value to the profession by sharing it with your network. I'd love it if you both subscribed to the podcast and to the YouTube channel, or whichever is your preference for consuming the episodes. You can find all of the links from the conversation in the show notes at trxl.co, where you can also sign up to get an email from me each time new episodes are released with those show notes and links within. So now, without further ado, I bring you my conversation with Shane Berger. There's been more than one tweet thread I put out there related okay. to some frustrations that I've had um, with how the software industry uh, deals with users, deals with pricing and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think, you know, to give a little bit of context to what the, where, what led to this and where this conversation basically came from is that um, I have found that a lot of the software companies have been pricing their software based upon how they measure its use, what they consider to be valuable from a profit perspective which I don't blame them because they, they're a profit making company. They wouldn't right. exist if they weren't making a profit. Right. Um, but what ends up, we run into an issue is that when these things butt heads with, um, how we actually operate as a company. So some of the examples would be, there was a company that we have been, uh, working with, and I will say things have gotten better and resolved better out of this, but there's a company I've been working with 
uh, from an infrastructure perspective to build out a whole visualization analytics platform that we've been working on for a good, probably two or three years now. And unfortunately, they switched over to a per user based pricing system. Uh, now that per user based pricing system was something that works well for other industries where if someone's going to be using this particular platform, it's their full time job. Mm -hmm. They're going to be on it all the time. Right. And it will be what they do for eight hours a day through 65 days a year. Right. Yeah. And for that, I would expect to be paying five to ten thousand dollars a year per user for that type of thing, because it is it makes up the totality of your job. Right. However, in other industries like ours, this is a platform that we would only use on an occasional basis. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that is most suited towards early concept and schematic design, which means from a phase perspective, you're only, only going to be using it for the first few months of what might be 12 to 18 to 24 month long project. Yeah. Um, so therefore, if you're going to be charging on a per user basis uh, for that type of thing, we are paying what is full price as if someone was using 365 days a year for something that would actually be used off and on for a few months and perhaps only by a few users. And even within that set, it might only be that, you know, someone like me might jump into it a few days. Yeah. So I'm paying basically the same price at that point. And what happens then is when you start scaling that up across a practice, we are looking at something that was going to cost us you know, half to three quarters of a million dollars a year mm -hmm. for something that was of occasional use. So that sort of mismatch between the pricing model and what our industry does and how we operate was a, was a, a frustration. Now, luckily, in this sort of case, the conversations with this company, they understood that better. And after a while, they were able to change the model that actually better accounted for how much that tool is actually being used. So a good example for me about this is the difference between per user pricing and consumption pricing. Consumption pricing is, um, so as opposed to per user pricing where you pay like $5,000 per year for, for that user, consumption-based pricing is if I use it a lot, I pay more. If I use it very little, I it's, pay very little. Yeah, it's like a utility, um, right? I, or it's like putting gas in your car. Right. It's, 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 yeah. I tend to prefer consumption-based pricing, especially for an industry like ours, where besides the core tools of Rhino and Revit, where we have our staff using them all the time, um, a lot of the other tools are occasional. You're going to use them a few days in a week, a few hours in a day, or even less than that. So paying the exact same price if it was your full-time job versus if it's an occasional thing doesn't work out as well. So we've been trying to suggest when we're speaking with a lot of vendors about something closer to a consumption-based pricing as a utility, as you said, or, um, and we've done this with uh, a couple of other companies as well, uh, we buy the licenses, they watch our use for three to six months, and they come back to us and say, okay, well, you have, in our case, 800 users in the system. However, only 300 actually use it on a very regular basis. So we're not going to make it hard for you to add users, but we're going to charge you 300 users. Mm -hmm. And then we'll come back a year from now and we'll top it up if we need to. So that yeah. sort of pricing model works a lot better for larger companies where we don't want to have to spend a lot of money to manage the users. We don't have to hire people full time to manage those users. Um, at the same time, I feel it right sizes it based upon the kind of company and the size of the company and how much you're using it. OK, so I'm going to welcome you back to the podcast officially. I'm still. Oh, putting, yes. I'm, that is still going to be in the episode right there. Okay. We're just going to have yes. jumped right into it. So welcome back. It's great to see you again. I'm glad we got to see each other at AU and make this happen. Yeah. And you've been on a whirlwind uh, tour of speaking gigs. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what I'm going to say. And you've been presenting a lot of topics around um, digital practice and design technology and how firms work. And this subject is near and dear to my heart. I want to give the tech side of our industry a look behind the curtain of what it's actually like to work in a firm, manage operations, people, users, licenses, IT, digital technology, design technology, all these things. So this is this is a great place to kick off this episode. And you said it's good for big firms. I think it's good for small firms too, because it's even worse in a small firm. You have way more roles combined into a single person's daily, you know, set of tools that they're going to be using. They're going to be managing the project and designing the project and going to construction right. administration. In a, in a larger firm, you do have more disparate roles for all of those things, but it still totally makes sense what you're saying because our projects last years. We don't do the same thing day in, day out. 
I don't need a visualization license when I'm, well, maybe I do nowadays, but I didn't used to need a visualization license in certain phases of design. And so for, as an example, now, now I think we, we tend to use those quite more often in, in many more stages of design. So maybe that's the worst example I could have chosen at the, at this, at this moment. But I think it's, it's, it's interesting. You said you're having these conversations with developers. How is it being received? And and obviously you gave an example of where it's kind of working and you do this annual reconciliation of what's actually been happening because you can measure all that. Um, mm-hmm. But but how is it being received? Because the, the per user, the named user license model, we've seen some big companies move back to that, like SketchUp recently as, as an yeah. example, you know, within the last few years, move back to that model. And it was kind of shocking to firms who were like, we might have a designer jump in and jump out of SketchUp for a small portion of a project, and then they don't need it for quite a while. And I don't want to pay for it the whole time. It's expensive. And we can't spend a lot of money on all the tools. It just doesn't work for our right. budgets, right? So how, how are they receiving this message? I'd say it's it's a bit hot and cold. It depends on the company. There's been some that we've spoken to I would actually say the companies we've spoken to that are not as much in our industry. So the Miros of the world and others who are doing things with us, but are not just a core AEC tool. Yeah. Um, actually are treating it quite well because it's, it's a bit of discovery for them. They're like, oh, we didn't realize that. We didn't know that's how you use it. And that's great. So it's been an open conversation and we've been very transparent and said, hey, we'd love to show you what we do with it to help you out, to better understand what you can do to help our industry. I'm having mixed luck, arguably, with uh, those who are closer to the AEC industry. Um, yeah. you know, there are a few companies out there that have made that transition to the named users where um, their answer and response, and I, I, I'm going to deliberately stay away from naming names in these cases, sure. but um, they would they would basically say back to us, okay, but this is what we're doing. And that's yeah. kind of been their response. And it's frustrating because in some of these cases, the the perpetual license model, especially the one that allows you to put the licenses into a queue and then anybody in the company can use them wherever we want. Check them out. Right. Is the closest version to a consumption model without going to a consumption model because right. we would be watching after our license counts. We've got our own systems internally able to actually track how we're using those licenses over time. So we'd be able to look at and say, you know what? We've got 150 licenses. We've been hitting 145 consistently, and that number is going up. Let's top it off with another 10. And we buy another 10 so that we never run out. Because a larger company like us, you don't want to run out. You start getting emails and text messages from people. Totally. Um, So that model worked well for us, um, but it also probably wasn't an area of uh, increased profitability for those who are selling the licenses. So I think a lot of the companies who changed to a named license model, looked at that and said, well, here's a way that we can increase profits by selling more licenses just by switching to a named user model. And uh, frustratingly, it's often sold as something that they think we would like. And I think yeah. in my case, it's it's often I've said, I understand how you want that, but this is absolutely not something that we actually want. Um, and we've had an increasing number of companies switch over to that sort of model which now means that I have to start pricing it very differently uh, as to how we do this. I don't want to be restricting the amount of people use the licenses, um, but by going to a named license model, it forces me to either restrict it to cap it at say 50 or 100 or whatever we have, and then we have to internally shuffle licenses around, or we have to manage buying new licenses every few months to just top it up and keep going that direction. Um, It doesn't reflect the realities of how a business like ours actually operates. And the managerial aspect of that, just to open the window to give people an idea of what that is like, this is a big deal. Like just to have the staff in place to constantly be monitoring and managing and potentially purchasing and getting approvals to do all this. It's a nightmare. It's a literal nightmare oh, yeah. with all the different software. And and just so paint that picture. What does it actually look like for you guys to, to have to deal with that? I think the first thing is if I think about it from a user perspective, um, I've got a job I've got to do. I, I'm working on a project. I need to either access a particular file or do a piece of work. I've got a deadline coming up in three days. Um, and I try to open a piece of software and I don't have access to it. What am I going to do for that afternoon? So from a user perspective, it's incredibly frustrating because then they have to put in an IT support ticket or text somebody that they know who might be able to help them out. 
Um, usually that involves including a principal on the chat. So hoping that the principal can weigh in on it and say, please let Make us get it happen. That. Yeah. <laughs> Make it happen. Right. Right. Um, in some cases that principal will bypass us and purchase it with a, a company card, which is yeah. something we don't want to have oh, happen. Because whenever that happens, we start ending up with licenses just spread and prolifer proliferating. Yeah. Right. And we don't, <laughs> and all of a sudden we'll get a message from some company we've never heard of saying, are you going to renew this? It becomes difficult to manage. Um, it's the ad hoc license purchases and spreading around with different accounts and everything is just a significant amount of work to manage just from a, a logistics point of view. How do you actually deal with that? Um, and then when it gets to, say, the IT staff, they'll get it and they'll ask the question, well, what do they need it for? Um, is this actually necessary? So a judgment call has system start to come into play. You know, they've been maybe told that we're supposed to cap it at 50 licenses. So we either need to contact someone else in the company and say, do you need your license anymore? Do we look at our dashboards and see who hasn't used it in the last 60 to 90 days and say, we're going to remove it? For that user, that's not a good experience because they may need it next week. So we end up having to shuffle licenses around and have a lot of uncomfortable conversations with staff who are rightly frustrated, mm -hmm. who don't want to have to deal with this sort of thing. Um, then when it comes to the process of you know, when we do need to make a judgment call, there's a lot of back and forth conversations. Can you use the free version if it's commercially viable? Uh, someone else on your team already has a license. There's all these things that come into play when you have to deal with a per user license or you're capped in some sort of frustrating way. All of this creates an experience, I think, for the end user that is uh, understandable frustration towards the technology teams. But those technology teams have a hand tied behind their back, either by the licensing system by the software vendor, or perhaps from a budget perspective. But then arguably the staff also has a sort of bad taste in their mouth, perhaps even towards the vendor who put this situation in play in the first place. Yeah, And we'll have to communicate with those staff and say, listen, we're doing what we can, but uh, the way that the vendor has the system set up, it's not easy to manage users. There's one vendor that we work with where um, we actually have to, if a staff member was to leave the company, yeah. or stop using the software. They Before they uninstall the software or leave the company, they have to disconnect the license from the license manager system in the software. So say you're leaving company, I'm going to have to go up to you and say, please launch this program, log into here, disconnect your license and move onward. Say their computer crashes and they have to rebuild the computer. That license is lost for a year. And we've had that happen enough times. It's not to say our computers crash all the time, but it happens thousand person company, it happens. Um, there's lots of circumstances that actually prevent you from being able to do that. Because there's no central management interface, I have the email address of the person I have to shoot an email off to to get them to add licenses to top us up because I can say this user either is no longer at the company um, or uh, they had an issue with their computer. So you see two versions, two licenses, they don't, they just have one. That's a lot of headaches that nobody should have to deal with. And it creates a sort of bad experience for everybody that's involved. Whereas very simple changes to how these licensing systems work, give people the opportunity to use the tools. They don't have to ask for permission. They don't have to fight to, you know, have one person release their license so someone else can use it. Um, I don't understand why any company would want to prevent people from using their software by actually making additional headaches from a management perspective. There's so much in there. And I, I, I'm glad you brought up the staff leaving aspect to it be, because turnover happens and it happens quite often in architecture firms. I mean, it, they staff up, they staff down. There's certain right. firms that do that a lot. There's other firms that try to hang on to people as long as possible. And maybe it's less of an issue, but other things in life happen too. Things change all the time or just getting new computers or whatever. Right. And, and so there's there's so much nuance to this and i think what it all comes back to is like not caring about the actual users and it's more mm -hmm. about looking like it it it's going to be more efficient because maybe maybe that's the expectation is that it is going to be more efficient but it's more efficient for the vendor it's not more efficient for the firm itself to do all this and and who actually is monitoring email like a hawk all the time because that's the expectation too, right? If I send in a support ticket that I need this thing right now, it's the expectation is I need this thing right now. And if you're right. in a 1,000 person firm, 
that's not going to happen either, right? And so, like, the, the just the uh, queuing times that are going to happen because of this uh, predicament. And and I want to, I just want to double down on what you said. You said maybe the, the staff gets a bad taste in their mouth towards the vendor. I, I think that is less the case than getting a bad taste in your mouth about your own IT department, your own yeah. D- DT department, because yeah. they're the ones telling you no. You can't get into all the nuance of why this is happening like this, that it's actually the vendor that's forcing us to do it this way. And again, I think it's about the vendor not caring about the actual end user of the software by creating these systems. And so uh, it does suck to hear that they're receiving this in a cold way, you know, for the most part. I have um, I even had a conversation just over the last two days with... Um, a company that provides uh, generative AI image creation services uh, services that doesn't offer an enterprise approach. So their answer was, well, just set up individual accounts for every single person. Well, we've got between 75 to 90 people in the company who are playing around with these things. And that yeah. is now 75 to 90 people, individual accounts linked to my work Amex card. And just that's not right. how this is going to work. <laughs> so, you know, and yeah. I've I've had this with lots of different companies that, you could create the most amazing piece of software in the world. People could absolutely love the features. If you make it a nightmare for uh, uh, IT and design technology staff to manage the system, I'm likely just going to say no, because we yeah. don't want to put ourselves in the position of being the people that's having to tell staff, no, you can't have it because the licensing is preventing us from doing this in this way. Um, it's uh, it, it makes it really hard for a company like ours ultimately to be able to manage this type of stuff. Staff members shouldn't have to even know anything about licensing systems. Right. They right. should not have to care. Should be they completely just want transparent. To, right. They just want to do their jobs. They yeah. want to be able to open what they need and get access to what they want and use it. And then they shouldn't have to be doing, oh, I have to release my license or who do I need to talk to whether we've hit our quota in the studio for such and such license. That should never be a conversation for them. And I and yeah. ideally then you should make the lives of the technology staff and the company easier such that we're not having to then explain that or have to be the bad guys to tell people no in that situation because you've made the whole situation more difficult. So I do very much steer away from a company that's going to increase our management overhead. If we have to start adding staff whose entire job is to just managing users and data in these systems, you start building up enough of that. It gets incredibly frustrating and difficult to deal with. And even like a token system, which is another weird version of the consumption slash prepaid. You know, it's weird, right? You don't want to have a staff member like running out of tokens right when they're in the on a deadline, for example. So that's not a good solution either. Yeah. Well, tokens for a few cases is, yeah, buying them in advance and topping them up versus true consumption systems. Just you're going to pay for it after you've actually used it. Right. I would say there's some there's some. Difficult parts about to, um, and consumption systems, it's harder to budget for them. But sure. budgeting and restricting should not be the same thing. You don't budget in advance and then stop people from using things. A budget should be an estimate of where you think you're going to go. And in any consumption-based system, you should be able to watch the analytics to see you ultimately where they get to. The other frustrating thing about token-based systems is I'm generally not a fan of abstract currencies yeah. in order to <laughs> to pay for these things. Right. How much is that? One token is a dollar ninety U.S. dollars. Like, what does that actually mean? And right. what does it mean to consume those tokens? Again, th- this seems to be adding a layer of abstraction to something where, in the gray areas and the gaps in between, it will inevitably be more profitable for the software company versus just paying for actual consumption. Yeah, like just defining the value and how much it costs to achieve that value, I think, is a reckoning that really needs to happen. And I guess we could continue to flog this. But do you want to talk about who who's doing this right? Like, you don't, we don't want to name who's doing it wrong. But is there anybody that like right. springs to the to mind that that you are enjoying <laughs> their licensing model that you want to give a shout out to? Well, I have to give some real credit to what happened for us with Miro. And Miro was a case of where it started off on a per user basis um, and it was going down the direction of the named user approach. But then what we we able to show them is, uh, first of all, they gave us some room. They said, all right, we're going to do a quarterly update top up agreement with you. You have a certain number of licenses and every quarter we're going to have a conversation to look at your use and we won't restrict with how many users you have, but we're going to look at it. 
Ultimately, we end up signing a three-year agreement with them based upon that sort of model, but it's a yearly kind of update. The thing I appreciate about them was they uh, used the data to inform the decision. They looked at how we were actually using their tool, frequency at which people were using it, how they were using it, even down to the point of understanding the difference between uh, what a viewer license was versus a creator license, someone mm -hmm. who's actually making boards and editing them mm -hmm. versus who's just looking at them. They had the back end analytics to actually answer that question to which they were like, oh, OK, yes, you do want to have all thousand, 1000 people in. They listened to us when we said we don't want have to have one IT staff member sitting in there constantly adding and removing people all the time. And I we did it for a few months to show them what the effort looked like and how it was kind of ridiculous that this was happening, even to the point of pointing out to them that even our CEO and some of our global design leadership were viewer staff, which weren't really counting as full licenses, but they were going to get pulled out of the cutoff because the frequency at which they did what was called, I think, a paid action or something. They were mostly viewers engaging in design reviews, not creating their own boards. So we explained to them, you're putting us in a scenario where um, arguably, if we follow our rules, our design leadership would not always be given full licenses. They understood what that meant and they came back to us and said, all right, here's a pricing model that we're going to put together for you that is um, based upon uh, how much you actually use the tools. Mm -hmm. So we're going to open it up. We'll use single sign-on, allow you to add all the users that you need into the system. But what you're going to pay for is people who are actively using it. And that, was a, that ended up working out a lot better. I would say, though, that that is likely a scenario that's only going to work for a large company mm -hmm. because it does require a direct engagement with a sales representative to be part of reviewing a kind of a customer success manager sort of system. So that's something that I think you would definitely uh, need is it would benefit from being a larger company to be able to negotiate that sort of relationship with them. I have been finding there's other companies out there that do similar types of models. And while we haven't done it yet, but our work with Atlassian, my team uses Jira, the IT team uses Jira as well. We have increasing numbers of people in our operations team using it. When we pass a certain threshold, they do the same type of thing. We haven't mm -hmm. really passed that threshold, but the conversations have gone really well with that. Um, there are other companies out there that I think do a relatively good job of it, even if I have some of my frustrations. I do fundamentally like Autodesk's model. It's a token-based system. However, it is a consumption-based system. And there are things I like about how they do it. And it puts us in a position where it does right-size it based upon how much we actually use the tool. Now, granted, it's, you know, it's not recorded hourly. It's if you use it during the day, you pay for the whole day's worth. I can maybe understand that sort of scenario, but I do appreciate their approach on that because that is uh, closer to actually paying for our real use. Um, other companies like McNeil have kept to the traditional perpetual license model. Um, and in that sort of case, we I think we own something like 150, 160 licenses, and it covers our whole company globally that actually use it. Uh, you know, our, our peak use period is pretty much when we get to New York City evenings and West Coast afternoons and Australian mornings. I think that's typically our peak use or a little bit further when China starts to come online. Uh, but we have purchased it based upon that amount and we're able to watch using their analytics to see when we're peaking up to that particular level. So that's the traditional older style perpetual license model, but it works really well. And we keep buying licenses and nobody loses their chance at a license. There's other companies that have done perpetual license models, though, that have not provided analytics. So one in particular, I won't mention, but a, a, around some visualization tools we've run into where uh, it is a perpetual license model, which is great, but they don't provide any insight into how much we're actually using. Yeah. And we're having trouble internally recording how much it's actually used because it's a plug into a tool. So it's yeah. not easy to actually get insight into it. So that's one of those ones where we have run into issues where um, we don't end up topping up licenses until we run out and someone starts talking to us about it. But we also don't know if we can downscale licenses. Visualization market is really competitive. There's lots of competing tools. We have people trying more than once. We might actually be able to shift the balance of licenses between them. But unfortunately, we don't have enough insights into how much it's actually being used. And you can deploy kind of insight machines on your side of the pond as yes. well, right? But again, more to manage, more to watch, more to track, a lot more conversations we, with users. 
Right. A lot of these companies have their own tools. Sometimes they will allow you access to those analytics. Mm -hmm. um, so that is uh, that is great. A uh, good example, actually, also on the positive side is um, the company Avail that makes the Revit content management system, which is our, our preferred choice for a system. Um, they have provided us with um, uh, Power BI. I think it's Power BI. I could yeah. be wrong. But dashboards that gives us insight into the actual use. They're another company that also has given us open access or unlimited access, but we top it up every year. We have mm -hmm. conversation with them to say, this is how much we're using and how much we pay. So they watch what our numbers are and they provide access to all the analytics for us to actually understand, is it being effective? Is that good for us? It's something I would like to see more of from other companies. So either access, they either provide the dashboards or give us access to dashboards to pull data in. If those aren't the case, we end up having to use some of our own tools. So we're in the process now of consolidating our tracking systems on all of our various tools. And that's everything from commercially purchased software, where they sometimes provide analytics, to platforms which we have no analytics. And we're having to you know, use systems built into Windows to be able to keep an eye on how much people are using the tool, down to some of our own tools um, that uh, are plugins automation tools so we can track how much people are using them yeah really for us it's it's a combination of wanting to know are we investing our money in the right place do we need to buy more licenses so people don't run out but also ensuring we're providing the right balance of support so if we start seeing significant amount of use in one tool versus another it might highlight to us to say we should be investing more energy in keeping that up to date if it's a tool we've built maybe providing updates to it but also making sure we can support the users so our analytics work is going to become pretty important, I think, over the next six months to try to pull all those dashboards together. That was a really nice, unplanned, unscripted high five to Avail, who's also sponsoring this episode. Oh, of the podcast. yeah, there so. you go. That's great. Now, it, it's um, I appreciate when companies uh, understand the needs of what an architecture practice is looking for and do something that suits and balances without that is how how those companies operate. Avail's been one of them. There's, as I said, Miro, not from our industry, has learned and has helped with it. There's others that are out there that I'm probably not remembering at this moment. But um, I do appreciate when it's a uh, a more reasonable conversation about uh, how the tool is actually being used. This episode is made possible with support from Avail. Avail makes the best software to manage all of your AEC digital content. Dedicated to developing tools that save AEC teams time, Avail has now added Revit application version management to its suite of content management capabilities. Once a painful manual process, Revit application versioning is now automatic for Avail customers. Publishers simply upload files to an Avail channel, and the files are automatically converted to newer versions from Revit 2021 through Revit 2025. For users, the experience is then seamless. They can search, select, and utilize the Revit content in Avail, regardless of what Revit version they are working in. Inquire about a demo of Avail and its new Revit application version management features today at getavail.com slash request dash demo. My thanks to Avail for supporting this episode of the Troxel podcast. And now let's get back to the conversation. I feel like that's more of a partnership. Like they, they have a genuine interest in the value you're deriving from their tool to do your work, right? It's not just yeah. to have this relationship with them. Like you're not buying their software just so that you get to talk to each other, right? You're employing it for a purpose. And if they're genuinely interested in what people are getting out of that and what you're doing with it, that partnership I think does lead to the kind of relationship that you're talking about rather than the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. I think we've had some successes with that. We've had some frustrations. I think the most of the frustrations have occurred when this is a company that provides the same software to multiple parts of your industry that it may be used in different ways. So an example would be a software that is used by contractors and architects. Well, which one do you price it for? Right. Do you price it based on what the contractor is going to look for, which they tend to have um, you know, a, a larger ability to spend money on software than an architecture practice? or what the architecture practice is, is going for. And when we have imbalances or differences like that, we usually run into some uh, differences of opinion about how we should price it. And in contrast to manufacturing, where you're making widgets or you have an assembly line where somebody does a specific thing day after day, to your point much earlier in the conversation, this is not that. This is, you're, we're, 
an architecture firm is not a company that makes the same the same person makes the same thing day after yeah. day after day. It just doesn't work like that. Project teams disband, come back together in a different amalgamation to tackle a new project at a different phase in a different part of the world with a all these differences amongst multiple years throughout the phases of a project. And and that I think is something that is different. I don't know if it's unique about architecture, but it's definitely different than like when Miro comes to you and they're working with somebody like GE, let's say, who's mm -hmm. making jet engines. Like that's going to be very different from what an architecture firm does, right? So it's really interesting to me to hear that they were interested in finding that out and not just sticking mm -hmm. to like, this is how we do it, which is the answer that you also showed as a, a contrasting answer. It's like, nope, this is how we're doing it. Um, and not willing to listen, not willing to maybe care about what the users actually need. And so just just maybe to wrap this part of the conversation up, um, have you actually gone through, I, and I assume the answer is yes, but I want to hear it from you, to just say, okay, that tool's gone. Like we can't use that tool, at least until we come back and revisit it at some other time. Uh, yes, it's hard to do. And mm -hmm. I, I would say I'm not always People successful love their tools, man. Yeah. They they do. And I get it. And I, I understand because it's it's what you've been using for years exactly. or a decade or more. Right. And it is the it's the instrument that you are used to expressing the work that you're doing. Um you're efficient at it. It's like mm -hmm. learning any instrument. Um, you know, you're gonna say, Nope, you're not gonna play violin anymore. Here's a trumpet. I you know, what am I supposed to do with it? I I have lost my ability to um, you know, to execute on the work that I'm used to doing. So it's disruptive. Uh, for what is already a stressful, high paced sort of profession, when you are removing people's access to the tools and systems that they're using, that they're used to using to do their job, it's a significant stress. It's a high level of frustration. Um, but yeah, we've had situations where we've had to basically say, well, we no longer use this particular tool. I'd say it's more common that we limit its use. So, you know, one of the modeling tools that we've limited use on is a case of where we have selected particular sectors or subsets or studios that have access to it because it may be necessary based on the market that they're working in. That particular yeah. region, it's the most common tool that people use to share models back and forth. So, okay, I get that. Or um, there's a particular set of features or workflows that are essential for this and they need to use it quickly for this work. It's short, you know, a short turnaround sort of work and it is the most effective one to do that. I get that, I understand it. That desire to have an individual choice of the tools that you use runs up against not just things from a cost perspective, but also from a collaboration perspective. Uh, if we don't try to unify around a small subset of tools, when you start sharing projects from studio to studio, it becomes next to impossible to actually be effective on that. So if one person is using a completely different tool than everybody else's, then that person is kind of separated from how the rest of the group is actually going to operate. And you have immediately some built-in inefficiencies. And people say, oh, just, just export your 3D model. And, and you lose something every single time. You lose stuff right. every time that happens, right? That's, that's the biggest downside to that. It, so it, It's not just that you've lost things from a technology standpoint. It's lost from a workflow standpoint. You have mm -hmm. now decoupled the work of one person in the team from the rest of the team. Right. Um, it effectively just turns into... Okay, I see what you have over there. I'm going to look at that while I'm working on what is our main tool that we work within. Yeah. And it, when you decouple those sort of processes uh, in delivery, you have inherent inefficiencies, even beyond um, issues of file formats. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I want to shift now to maybe the future of the profession, but I want to kind of couch mm -hmm. that at least get into it with tools. And so you mentioned AI earlier, right? And so yeah. we're we're seeing changes happen. We're seeing disruption happening and you also talked about kind of the limiting factors of licensing for enterprise and things like that but let's start to talk about ai and the future of the profession as a as a lead-in because obviously the future of the profession does not equal ai right so i want to talk about that in a, in a bigger scale uh, but in a way to get there let's just talk about kind of the emergence of ai and what that's meant at woods bagot and and for you and your teams yeah, I think um, we've been keeping an eye on what were the potential opportunities for us for many years now, but it wasn't until, and this is probably the same for a lot of architecture practices, mm -hmm. um, tools like Midjourney and Stable Diffusion and DALI coming out in combination with ChatGPT. And 
I think for us, it was initially catching up to what the conversations that everybody was having around those tools, where we think they would be a value to the practice, where we think there are some concerns and limitations for each of them. But at the same time, actually trying to project forward, well, what's next after this? We didn't want to be in a position where we're always running to catch up and every three months there's something new. Mm -hmm. uh, when I presented to our shareholders conference just two weeks ago, I ran a two hour afternoon workshop on AI and architecture and design. Um, wasn't just two hours of presentation, but a lot of back and forth and debate and discussion about what this means for us as a practice and, and how does this fit with our, our credo, how we approach our work. Um, one of the key things to point out was that just the week before, it was when OpenAI Sora came out, the video mm -hmm. creation tool. Mm -hmm. uh, not something I had in my presentation, but of course I added it right in there and just basically explained to everybody, these sort of innovations are happy on a regular uh, basis. So what are the fundamental trends? What are some of the things that sit underneath this that gives you a, a sense of what direction these things might actually be going? Um, and that was where we kind of ended on a, a series of topics that should be discussed um, and we should be considering how they affect our practice. One of the biggest and first ones is the fundamental change about how we access knowledge. And we started asking questions of, of we've got 150, 160 years of practice, 18 studios around the globe, multiple sectors, a thousand people. What happens when you have access to that kind of information in the context, in a context relevant way uh, to answer things that you need to know? You know, what happens in those sort of scenarios? And I, that became beyond the excitement, I think, about the image creation, which we can talk about and get into. I got more interested in to what it means to tap into and harness knowledge, not just within our practice, but within potentially the broader industry. I just want to stick a I want to get in here because this is what we talked about in the last time that we had a conversation mm. on the podcast. What you were we were talking about second brain, Rome yeah. research. Right, the interconnectedness potential of notes, like just talking about, yeah. like where do you take your notes? Where do you take your notes? How do you link between notes? Is there a way to get insight out of then all the notes you've taken, right? And now you're talking about that at scale. You're talking about yes. that in an organization. And it's a very, it's, it's, it's the same conversation, but it's just at a way larger scale. And so I'm, I'm interested in hearing it from, from that side, but I'm also interested in hearing about like the pursuit of creativity as well, because I think right. that's kind of the existential crisis that we see going on in firms as well. Not only from a, like, where does creativity come from? Is it going to take our jobs, but also ethics, governance, things like that too, right? There, there's a lot going on here in, in the whole AI yeah. sphere, but, but let's, let's continue to go down the, the knowledge side of the graph. And, and I, I'm curious to hear what, what you guys have come up with. Yeah. So, um, we have a set of documents in the company we call design intelligence documents. I may or may not have talked about them in the previous podcast. It's effectively a, an overview of all the major decisions around a project. Um, it's a way that if you're a new member of the team or want to know about what happened on a previous project you can go back, you'll say, well, this is the site, this is the client, this is what they asked for. Mm -hmm. Here's some of the early concept designs. This is how we got to where we were, the decisions that we made, the major concepts behind this. Um, and one of the questions that I started asking when things like chat GPT came out was, all right, well, they are large language models trained on the internet. So yes, they speak English and understand English and they can work with us that way. Um, what happens when we can train it on a particular subset of documents and ask questions of those documents? And this is something that I had seen others, you know, a year or so ago come out and say, well, what happens when I feed my favorite book into a chat engine? And now I can basically have a conversation with the book, mm. ask things about it, query it and have it, it bring up information for me. So we thought, why not try this out? So we actually use some of uh, OpenAI's tools via our Microsoft kind of uh, um, enterprise agreement to build a version of a chatbot that was a design intelligence knowledge chatbot. We just fed it 50 of them to start off with. Um, we had to do some work. Uh, I would say that it's not the easiest thing in the world. You can't just put any formatted document into a system like this. And I think we realized that sometimes our documents are more uh, human readable than machine readable. So there's some differences with how it would be you know, good to, to put into these systems to, to deal with potential hallucinations. But we fed 50 into this and we were able to ask questions like, you know, tell me about uh, any of the projects that have uh, timber structures. What are common characteristics or what were the core concepts behind them? 
And we started thinking about this to say, okay, well, if I'm wanting to know, if, I, if I'm guessing that someone within our practice or some project has encountered the problem that I'm encountering on my project right now, mm-hmm. what's the best way for me to find that information? Uh, a standard search will pick up topic names, uh, maybe even headings of particular chapters, but not really dig into the insights that are within these documents. It also won't be able to draw correlations between a concept in this project and a concept over here. Um, And often we found that while we create these documents, we've got something like, you know, 300 or 400 of these now, um, if not more. Um, Usually it's just principals and people who worked on the projects who actually are aware that they exist and not even knowing, however, unless they worked on it, the insights that sit within them. So for us, this became a potential rich opportunity for us to train up a knowledge bot that would be able to um, understand the history of our projects. And that could come in play in a few different places. One would be for a business development. So for chasing after new work, we're having an answer to an RFP. Um, I Rather than just going to my standard five projects I know that had a strong sustainability story along with them, I now have access to all the projects that have that information. And I can query them and it will bring them up and perhaps even help me author content. Not always the best authoring of the content, but it's going to surface things and insights that I may not have gotten unless I had actually read all 300 to 400 of those and internalized all the knowledge within. It might help during project design, during concepts, putting in queries, asking questions of this. Um, It might even help in later phases, especially when we're getting down into some material selections and later decisions, what projects have used this material. So... We then started to extend this to say, well, how about not just design intelligence documents? What about some of our technical guidance material, best practices for Revit, our global standards, so that when you're in Revit, you've got a little chat bot, you can ask it a question. Um, Maybe it's the second coming of Microsoft Clippy, I don't know, but it's some version of that, right? And then it went further to say, and this is where we we haven't gotten here yet, but we started to talk about it. Um, Why can't we be querying our library of... uh, BIM models in our system. Why can't we create something that's able to crawl through that and ask questions of all of our projects Mm -hmm. um, and be able to bring certain project metrics out or different things about the execution of that work? So this is where we saw the very beginnings of saying, all right, we've seen some companies teach or train a chat GPT like system on a particular subset of documents. There's one, for example, in scientific journals. There's a few. There are Upcodes has done this, obviously, for Code Review North America. What can we do when we do that? And then what are the next logical steps? Well, it need not necessarily be documents. What if it's other kinds of information that we have? For example, model content. So that's one example where that initial insight led us down the path into multiple potential opportunities for creating, we're basically surfacing context-relevant knowledge about our work. This episode is made possible with support from Avail. Along with their newly released Revit application version management, AEC software company Avail has added another powerful new workflow feature called Palettes to its suite of content management capabilities. Palettes are user-customized lists of content in Avail and can function as a favorites list, as starter content for a specific project, or to drive workflows such as redlining construction details. Customers and administrators can add pallets to their accounts through the Avail Manage Portal page today. Interested in seeing pallets in action first? Request a demo at getavail.com slash request demo. Avail helps AECO firms better manage, organize, and navigate information faster. My thanks to Avail for supporting this episode of the Troxel Podcast. And now let's return to the conversation. I think that's what's so interesting about it is like once you st- start going in a direction, light bulbs start turning on. And you're like, yeah. oh, what if we try this? Or And I, I find like really surprising results when I try something. Like I'll feed it images and just say transcribe these. And it and yeah. I didn't know if it could do that or not, right? But oh, it yeah. can, it turns out. And yeah. or, or I'll just feed it a web page that I did and, and I said pull all the names because I, I have pictures like when we were at AU, we took a picture. I put, it's, it's Evan and Shane. Here's a link to our previous episode. And I just grabbed that whole page and I said, just make me a list of all the names on this page. I didn't tell it what what format those names were in. Right. I, and it just right. made a list. And, and I'm, I'm surprised by that because 
like that would have taken me a lot of copying and pasting and a lot of time to do. But with a simple prompt, it's just like pull all the names out. Boom. There, there yeah. they are. I'm, I'm so happy that that worked. And I think that's what's kind of fun about this. It's kind of like when you learned how to start 3D modeling. It's like, I don't know how to build all the geometry. I'm just going to try something and see if it works. And if it works, it's great. And if it doesn't, okay, I'll try something else. I, it's a lot like building a piece of code or something, right? You're just constantly trying things and just being curious about it, I think, is one of the best positions to be in because then it's really non-committal, right? You don't have to worry about it performing right. explicitly so that you get the outcome you're looking for. But of course, that will happen over time because you will get actually get good at it. I think we're in a spot where the technology is quite advanced and can get super detailed in certain areas, but we haven't really looked at what the broader potentialities across our practice is. It's right. very easy to look right in front of you and say, well, yes, we want to have a chat bot that looks at our projects. And yes, we want to be able to do lots of image creation. And at some point, maybe it'll become model creation. I can see those sorts of things. Um, but the issue with this is that this is, I was about to say immature. I mean, it's been, a, you know, it's been talked about since the late fifties. So, right. you know, it's not immature, but it is but, early days, um, right? <laughs> it's early days for right. these types of things. Yeah. Um, I think every practice needs to be in a position of experimentation. And I think they need to be in a spot where the experimentation is happening broadly across the practice. One of the things that we've discussed with our company is to, to have a group of people so are a catalyst for conversations about AI and mm -hmm. the broad potential application on their projects. But then that group is supported by those who can take a deep dive from a technology and implementation perspective. So if someone sees an opportunity with a client to say, all right, well, we have a bunch of data from the client about their, um, about their workplace. We want to work with that information to then drive some auto layout features. Okay, they have the idea. They have the potential application on our project, but they don't necessarily have the, the technology muscle or the infrastructure or systems to then really take a deep dive to implement that system. So what I think we need to be doing as an industry is allowing that experimentation, especially at the face of projects, but then giving significant muscle and support behind those people. They themselves shouldn't be on or off alone doing this, mm -hmm. but there should be people who are then back within the kind of core of the company who are looking at these opportunities, some software developers within that group who are building out these systems and supporting them, maybe data scientists or data analysts, some combination of this group, um, who then also looks at what that person's doing and that person and that person and says, well, her work over there actually has an interesting overtone to the work that he's doing over there. Yeah. So here's something now, some commonality. And now right. this suggests we should be building systems that connect these together. I, we're in a spot with AI where if you're just looking for the solutions that are right in front of your face, by the time you implement them, the industry would have already gone three or four iterations down the road. Yeah. Right. So you need to be in a spot where, yes, you are doing those. That's just to keep up with the Joneses. I think you also need to have some experimentation within your practice to be asking the big questions. How is this relevant for us? It's not just about automating things. It's not just going to speed things up. But where does it provide increased value to your practice? Um, and not just in a generic way to architecture and interiors or urban design in general, but specifically how you do your work. How does this fit to how you work? So there needs to be conversations at a, at a technical implementation standpoint. But also from a strategic and vision standpoint, what does this mean for my company based on all those experiments that I'm seeing out there? Yeah, and I think what's interesting about the tools that we're seeing is you, you mentioned upcodes, you mentioned your design intelligence chatbot, right? You've got these really specific tools and that's how they work, right? We've Yeah. Th that's exactly how they work. They're super specific. But now we're starting to see like this idea of an AI agent that then connects these APIs together so that this one can go talk to that one and bring information back and it can talk to a third one and they can all connect and, and kind of huddle and bring back information that pulls a little bit out of each one of them. And to do what you're talking about, like you you basically described your AI team of, of what would yeah. be a firm's AI team. They have to have that big picture. They have to be tied into the business side and talking about strategies and the culture of the firm and what the the values of the firm and the specific roles and tasks that people have to do on a day-to-day -day basis and start to link up what 
problems and challenges do we actually have and then pick the right tools for the job, but have a really right. great understanding of all the tools on offer. And, and going back to like the budgeting and the user license thing, I think this is, it's making things actually way more complicated because we're seeing a boom in all of these tools, right? Just AI tools alone. If you just kept it in that bucket, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them all of a sudden, and they're all going straight to the users. They're not going through the traditional channels of how you would implement technology in a firm. If I worked at a firm and they didn't offer access to OpenAI, like I, I would go get my own license of it so right. that I could play around with it. But because I can, because OpenAI is talking directly to me or making me able to do that. So talk about a nightmare for a firm, <laughs> right? Like to go back to our earlier and budgeting and figuring out like crystal balling how much we're going to spend in different categories over the year. There's it, it's, it's just a, a big giant guess, right? Like we don't know what tools we're going to be using because we don't even know the projects we're going to have this year, right? So yeah. I think there's always going to be some of the usual suspects that, of course, we're going to use this and that on this project because we always use this and that. But there's all these other things now, too, that are proving to be incredibly useful or we're experimenting, right? We're trying to find that out if they're going to be useful or not. And then we have to keep our fingers on the pulse constantly over time because they're also changing and updating and they're, they're pivoting quickly as well. We see that happening all the time. So from a DT, IT perspective, bigger nightmare, bigger team, like what, what's, what do you have to do to actually keep, keep abreast of what's going on? Right. I, I mean, unfortunately, it does end up needing to have a bigger team to cover this amount of, of um, spread between different tools that are out there. Yeah. I mean, we don't, you know, the, the work happening on uh, image diffusion is mostly, mostly myself with another member of my team who have been experimenting with it for you know, a good year or more. Um, but even then, there's a number of the tools that we haven't had a chance to, to properly try out or really to push ourselves through. Um, I can think of at least three, three, maybe four tools that are being used in our practice in terms of image diffusion right now. Um, at some point, we'd like to get it to one would be the ideal scenario. Um, and we're talking with companies about uh, which one we end up going with. Um, but there's you know strong preferences and experience with each of these. And every two months, another one comes out with a different model or new feature, and they leapfrog each other. And right. everybody rightly and understandably has preferences as to which one that they like to work with. But as a company, we need to at some point settle on what is the primary tool that we're going to be using. When it comes to the chatbots, uh, you add on top of this, and this is arguably still in the image section too, the concerns about intellectual property. They all have different rules about what information that you could submit to them that won't be training their model. Mm -hmm. I've appreciated that things like uh, you know the the chatbot, the co-pilots that Microsoft is releasing based upon ChatGPT4 uh, do have protections for a company like ours. If you have an enterprise agreement, uh, things that you submit into it will not be going to train the model. Uh, so I do appreciate that that sort of thing is happening. But um, a lot of this is going direct to the consumers, direct to the staff. They're experimenting with this at home. They've got, you know, the apps on their phone that they're right. popping in queries and stuff. Don't blame them. It's like it's right in front of them. It's easy to use. Sometimes it's completely free. But we have to be very aware that if there's project information or staff information that are going into these systems, we have to start thinking about uh, privacy rights, intellectual property, copyright, all those types of things have to come into play. So yeah. un unfortunately, um, just around the time as we started creating some forms that would help us better understand the full list of things we need to consider for new platforms, there was a huge explosion of the amount of those platforms of which we need to answer those same questions. So it's getting harder to manage that significant increase that's out there. I really do appreciate, though, the significant competition that's out there. I think a lot of these companies started off by saying, well, we know how to do this with AI, so let's find the market that will work with it. And now they're starting to get feedback from customers like ourselves who are saying, hey, that's cool and all, but we really needed to do this, this, and this. Um, a good example just with the, the image tools is uh, the first versions that were out there were very much a, um, we know how to create this sort of technology, throw it out there, see what people are doing with it. Now the next sets of features that are showing up are based upon feedback that uh, people are giving it. We've given similar types of feedback to AI tools that have been built into Rhino and Revit saying, hey, that's great, but 
it actually would help everybody if you, you know, if it understood the materials that it was looking at or the three dimensionality of the object in order to inform the image creation. So, um, I, at one point I'm excited. Mm -hmm. I love seeing all the new tools. I love seeing the companies leapfrog over each other. I love seeing all the innovation. Um, but then if I, I put my, my, um, IT, you know, management sort of hat back on my head again, I start getting scared of the amount of things that we have to cover at the same time. And yeah. again, we don't want to be in a spot where we're telling people no, but as a company that has clients with confidential information and there's issues of, of intellectual property ownership and there's costs associated with all of that, as well as buying licenses, um, we have to be on the conservative side. Yeah. There's a subject that I've been kind of knocking around in my head, which is unrelated. So we're going to take a turn here. But I'm curious what your feedback would be on it. Because, I, you know, if we talk about the future of the profession, one one of the things that we are mired in, and we're not alone, this is this seems to be everybody, is this idea of like pseudo productivity. It's very hard to measure productivity in architecture. And and now we're talking about tools that we're encouraging people to play with from a creative sense, but also from an efficiency sense. We've seen tools come along in the past that have promised efficiency and productivity, but it really hasn't led to that, right? Like our mm -hmm. main production pipeline has enabled us to put more into projects, but it hasn't really enabled us to spend less time doing that. But email, Slack, Teams, Zoom, that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about pseudo productivity. And when we're talking about a thousand people at a firm who spend a lot of time in email and in tracking all of the, and in conversations and what, what's your general sense about how much time people spend doing that versus actually doing the job? Because what, what I kind of feel like a reckoning that needs to happen is actual valuable output of architecture and that doesn't even necessarily mean creating drawings, right? That is a, a thing that we have to do to get the permits to build the building to satisfy the contract documents. And something that Clifton Harness said on a podcast a long time ago was like, if you want to really change architecture, change the OAC agreement, right? Like actually go to the root of where a lot of this is. And that's where the big fundamental changes. And I feel like we've been boiling the frog with email and with, it's like, okay, this is just the way that it is. But everybody is spending an unending amount of time being on call for anybody who dips into your inbox unwelcomed, right? It's never, it's never like the other way around. It's not like you invited them in. No, they just dumped something onto your to-do list for today. What's your sense? In a firm like yours, that big, I mean, it's just got to be an enormous, like you probably don't even want to know. But at the same time, like this is the stuff that people are actually doing every day. And you want to say, we're architects, we're build, we're, we're designing the world of the future, right? And, and at the same time, we're, we're doing email and we're on Slack all day long. Yeah, I, I, some of this is probably predating me by a number of years. Although I think when I started into, uh, sorry, work of architecture practices, I started doing my first internships in the late nineties and I would see this at this point as well, because not, mm -hmm. you know, not everybody in the, in the practice at that point had an email address associated with material as an intern, I didn't have an email address. So people came up to talk to me and I did what I was told to do. Um, and as part of that, the teams were structured in a way were more formally structured to have people who are kind of document and communication controllers. So they were basically holding back the floodgates of the information that was coming from clients and consultants, or they were in charge of communicating the material that was out there. Even when I started off at, at Grimshaw, uh, my job as a job captain was I was primarily responsible for dealing with issuing the, the updated drawing sets for backgrounds to our consultants to work with, receiving their information, coordinating, making sure that was all set. No one else in the team got involved in that conversation. Um, if there were particular flows of communication coming in, they had a particular person that they were associated with. Uh, at some point, it started turning into, uh, why don't we just create a uh, project number email address? Everything goes through that. Right. Well, then everybody has access to that. And then after a while, it becomes, no, just everybody gets all the emails. That's too much work to deal with a project control email. And this was back in the days when email was pop, right? And so it was right. like if, if one person logged into that email address, they were the only person going to download that email because it was yeah. going to get deleted off the server. We weren't even dealing with IMAP at that point. 
Right. And so this was this is a case of where um, we had limitations with the technology, but they, in a way, weren't too far off from how we were kind of managing projects and, and controlling those projects. Um, we now have uh, project management systems. We use AConnex for a lot of our work. People, we use all sorts of things that the contractors bring to the table. Um, but we haven't necessarily picked up, re, you know, returned too much the idea of document control or particular flows of communication mm -hmm. because um, email made it uh, effectively democratized access to communication and access to information. So then it meant, well, why don't I just go and ask the person that I know has the answer? Rather than going through, I, I would like the answer to my question. So I'm right. going to email you, Evan. Like right. you're the person I know that has it. Doesn't matter if you're not the, you know, don't have time to answer this. Right. I'm going right. to ask you or I'm going to text you in Teams. Right. When we opened up the flood of communication to be as ubiquitous across the entire project team, um, we lost control of the moments at which we can keep ourselves separated from that. And, and you end up having this sort of constant multitasking where there's always communications happening. Um, about a project that's interrupting my workflow and what I'm doing. I tend to be a person that works with headphones on because I get easily distracted and I cut out everything I possibly can because you know, I'll shut off notifications, I'll shut off everything because it's too easy to just say, oh, there's a little drip feed of things that are going totally. on. I think it's it's beyond just our profession. It, it's just yeah. made it very easy to be distracted about these things. The other thing about this, though, is that even when we attend meetings, especially post-pandemic, we're distracted. Um, not telling on anybody in particular, and I'm sure this is the case across every architecture practice, but when you walk through a studio and people are on video conferences with others, they have other programs that are up. They're doing drawing sets. They're doing other work. Totally. Only you half know. their attention is in the meeting at that point. They're catching right. up other things because they're busy. They've been handed way too many things to do, and there's no separation between what you, you know, um, how you communicate and when you work in these things. So it's a divided attention. So it's a, it's, a, it's a constant issue about distractions in terms of communications. And these things have not provided greater value to the work that they've we've done. It's just made us a lot, a lot busier. Um, I have mixed feelings about automation, about how we use automation and what the point of automation is. But ultimately for me, the, the, the real point around automation is I'll back up for a second, and then hopefully this isn't necessarily changing topics, but um, automation for me, uh, you could say uh, it's the client that benefits from automation. Well, if that's the case, then, you know, the client should have to pay less money for your project because you're able right. to automate, you know, uh, a third of your construction document set. So I'm going to pay you less money for that. OK, that's not necessarily going to benefit us. If I go and say, OK, it should be the owners and shareholders that benefit from this. All right. Um, fine that's possible right so we still charge the client same amount of money but we get increased profit from that side the third option would be to say it's the staff who benefit from automation and the reason why i focus on that is because ultimately any tool that we use i want it to create a better quality of experience a better value of experience for the people sitting at their desks if we can automate away something that was a mundane or repetitive tasks and giving them agency to then choose what they do in replacement of that, whether it's investing in the project in a different way or, God forbid, going to home to have dinner with their family, right? right? Like, <laughs> or not working a weekend and getting good sleep. All of those things significantly benefit their life and their project, um, their experience working for you, which is better for, you know, talent retention. Um they then contribute better to the project. They're well rested. They've appreciated the work that they've done. They haven't had to sit there for eight hours working on a door schedule, which they think is of low value to what they think they could provide to a project, which then means the project is higher quality, delivered more efficiently. So the shareholders of the company and the principals benefit from that. And ultimately the client benefits from it as well. So the, because they get a higher quality project uh, or product out of that work. So for me, if I look at any selection of tool that we're purchasing, Anything that promises greater efficiencies, um, better, you know, um, better communication, speeding things up, automating things, or a tool that we built. The question I keep coming back to every single time is, is it creating a better quality experience for the staff who are actively working on the project? If it's not doing that, then it's less likely we're going to go that sort of direction. That's my measure is, uh, will people actually... Not just necessarily that they need to enjoy it, but will it 
give them more agency over their time and give them an ability to provide greater value to the work that they do in the studios. My fear is that, and I don't think that that is disconnected from from the topic at all. I think it's right it's right in right in there. It's just a different way of looking at it because I don't think anybody goes to work and says they're planning on doing a bad job. And I think that's right. why BIM has led us down the path that we're on, which is it's it enabled us to put more data into the project. And and there is a, a thinking that more data is higher quality. It's a better mm. project. It hasn't taken away how much time it takes to do it. And in some cases, in many cases, it actually takes more time to do it the right way. And so that's my fear is that like tools will be sold under the guise of efficiency, productivity, um, deeper, higher quality work, but we will be spending more time because it's additive. Like all of these other communication tools that are swimming around us and distracting us and that we're forced to use them because my supervisor sent me an email and now I have to respond to it. Um, even though I wasn't planning on doing that today, because I need this software license back to the earlier part in our, in our yeah. conversation. Like there's all of these things pulling at us and, and they're all additive. Like there, there's never part of the conversation is like, okay, what do I deprioritize now? Because there's this new thing on my plate all of a sudden. And so that, that's where my fear is. And I, I, I love how you kind of bring it back to quality. My fear is that it's just more quality. It's just more and and that, right. Cause I, we, we've seen this before. Um, I think that there's like a reckoning that needs to happen at the highest levels of leadership in a company, which which says like we have to change the way we work, we have to, we have to be productive in the right ways with the kind of output. Like why do we exist? We do not exist to process email. We do not exist yep. to be on call for everyone all the time. And you're a global company. You have workers in Australia. There's a new bill that just passed the Senate. There, the right to disconnect. Have you seen this? I heard about it briefly, but yeah. I mean, the idea of it is is kind of insane and also totally expected, right? It's like, yeah. I don't have to answer emails or text messages after work hours. And and what's crazy is, is like, we're, we're, we're at that point. Architecture has been at this point forever, right? So this is nothing new for architecture. But it's it's like, after hours is when I actually get work done because I'm so distracted all day long, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you have a you have an Australian studio, right? And, and so, I, I don't know if how, if this affects you guys or not. I'm sure it does in some ways. But it's like it's it's this is kind of a again like a boiling the frog. Like this is just the way it is, and we expect it. And and I also feel like a reckoning needs to happen to say like, no, we're we do creative, world changing work. We are creators of the built environment. That's why we exist. And people hire us because. Woods Baggett is going to come up with ideas that we've never dreamed of. And, and that's why we chose to, and, and it's like, well, yeah, but you, we're spending most of our time processing email and replying to Slack messages. <laughs> and to go back to a little bit of the AI conversation, a lot of that stuff is the, is the sort of material that I would rather we focus more energy on as an industry to automate or to deal with, to get that stuff away. I mean, number one, I have to say, we have always have to ask the question, are we spending time developing automation tools for processes we should never do in the first place? Yeah. That's always the first thing, right? right? Should you even be doing that? But mm -hmm. for the things that we're doing, are there better ways of us actually providing access to the answers to the question, getting you to the outcomes that you're actually looking for? It's not just that you say you need this big report. What's the outcome you're looking for? I can probably provide that in a better way, mm -hmm. or I can build in systems or work with tools to help me kind of achieve that sort of goal. Instead, we've gotten excited about uh, uh, interjecting AI into the creative work, the thing that we a lot of us love and value and that we think we provide additional yeah. value to. What I'm really appreciating about these conversations that we're having within our practice right now is uh, in addition to looking at what we automate and where there's inefficiencies and problems in you know any of our processes that we think we can be better at and do better at, we're also asking some real questions. What is the, the human intelligence value? Where do we combine an AI and an HI or a human intelligence component? And what does this help us revalue about what we as designers, as architects, interior designers, urban designers, consultants, um, uh, value about our work? What, what's unique about what we provide to our clients? Mm -hmm. So it, it's actually turned into a really interesting, empathetic conversation. 
You know, how does empathy come back into it? Understanding what others are thinking and how others are working. I think I think we're going to get to this point where um, in my reference for this is uh, the uh, MIT researcher Marvin Minsky's concept of society of the mind. We're going to get to this point where we're going to have a collection of AIs around us, this sort of society of the mind of AIs that help us automate portions of our processes and the work that we do. Um, but my hope is that the end result of that is we become much more empathetic designers and people out of that because we can get rid of more and more of these things that are less necessary for our work and actually bring those qualities, those uniquely human qualities to how we design, how we work with our partners here in the studio, how we work with our partners outside and how we work with our clients. So I, I think it's, we've hit this real point of tension of where our industry feels like it's not as efficient as it could be, but we're overloaded with things that we think aren't of gr as great value Mm -hmm. I would hope it brings about real questions about what outcomes we're looking for, but also what value we bring to the table. There's a lot there. And I, you, you talked earlier about kind of automating away, maybe potentially having to do less, but but having a higher quality, more valuable experience, as well as uh, an output. Mm -hmm. I'm curious what you think about the idea with when AI gets involved in the creative process. So you just talked about kind of augmenting people, kind of co-designing human intelligence, artificial intelligence, augmented intelligence. I don't know. There's a lot of ways we could play right. with those words. But what kinds of things are you seeing there that you, you said you're playing with this? You've got a couple other people in the, in the firm playing with this. What potentials are you seeing here and what potential impact do you see it having on the architectural profession? Right. So I, I think the way that I this came up in a conversation with our principals a few weeks ago, and I, I gave a presentation to our global studio just last week about this. Hmm. And we were asking the question, can AIs be creative? Um, and a lot of this came back to, we you know, presented to the group, what is machine learning? How does it work? You know, it's a statistical model. Uh, the effectively generative AI is just an upgraded version of autocomplete. That seems like I'm dismissing it, but it's actually, that's an inc incredibly powerful concept. So it led to discussions about where it can make mistakes, things it can, can and cannot do. Um, for example, uh, it doesn't have a mental model of the world. It doesn't have a, a concept of mind, of, um, of how other people think. I know you as a human, so I look at you and I can make some assumptions about your method of judgment and your reasoning that gives me trust in what you're doing. And we can also speak a certain language with each other and understand that there's some similarities in the sort of backgrounds. But the things that we we're looking at were, um, I talked about three different kinds of creativity. Um, and I'm blanking on the author that this came from at the moment. don't have my notes in front of me, but um, one was called combinatorial creativity. Another was exploratory creativity. And then there's transformational creativity. And combinatorial, actually, I'll hit the second one first. Exploratory creativity is taking the context of a single style and exploring all the potential opportunities that sit within it. Um, and I've seen some examples of this out here when I looked at presentations, for example, by... Um, Patrick Schumacher for Zaha Hadid's office. They were showing how they fed in images of Zaha Hadid's work into Dali and explored all the potential opportunities that were sitting within that by giving just different descriptions. Um, at one point, I can see how maybe that would yield some new and interesting ideas. However, I had to back up for a moment and think to myself, those are not Zaha Hadid projects. Those are professional photographs of Zaha Hadid projects. Yeah. You are not pulling out of them the sort of essences that are really possible with these types of things. It's not that you want to mimic a style. You actually, through looking at the work of other people, want to get your head into the thinking of the artist and architect that created it. And this system is not permitting you to do that. Right. Um, uh, it is stopping you at a certain point. So that really frustrated me to see that. So then I started to think, OK, well, hold on. There's other methods that are out there. And that's when I get into combinatorial creativity. So with combinatorial creativity, there might be ways at which I mash up two styles with each other. You see this all the time. Um, I saw some great work from some um, architecture professors in university that were looking at skyscrapers and designs influenced by billowing fabric. And it was gorgeous. It was amazing. Yeah. And it, the ideas that started to pop up for you because it was combining something you knew maybe with something that you didn't know. Right. So it's opening up the wide array of possibilities. And in those sort of cases, we were also 
in our practice, looking at the opportunities for narrative to influence. So we'd almost tell a story or we describe an experience and see what images and things would come up. And it wouldn't be architecture, but it would be something evocative of a concept, something that got you excited and got you thinking. So never something you would show a client, except maybe if it was like a mood board. It's yeah. not architecture. It's yeah. a feeling. It's a mood. And, and there might be colors, textures, shapes, things that pop up that are representative of that mood that influence your thinking. So that was a spot where we had some level of excitement. But then we get to the third level of creativity, which is transformational creativity. And that is honestly where you take core concepts that might exist in other professions. Um, it might be um, allegory. It might be um, meaning that's derived from particular historic contexts, mm. things that are beyond what you can see just within an image, um, shapes and colors and textures and, and types of movement that have particular kinds of meaning combined with what we experience with our, our bodies. You know, our, our cognition is embodied cognition, so we have a different kind of experience. That is where transformational creativity comes into play because you've got to take things from other disciplines that are abstract concepts and apply it to your work. Um, that might be taken from music or dance. It might be taken from a scientific context or a historic event that happened on the site. That is where I've seen a lot more interesting innovations in architecture is that get to that level of transformational creativity. Those are the things that move the, our cultural needle ahead, right? Culture is not stagnant. Language is not stagnant. Style is not stagnant. Those transformational moments really move things forward. We don't get that out of an AI system because it, it's based upon the a particular two-dimensional representation of what we have seen in the past. So I think what we need to understand is that there are absolutely possibilities to explore ideas and extend our thinking and how we approach work, but we have to absolutely understand what those limitations are. Um, those, I almost, you know, the way that I've referred to it with our, our staff is treat it like it's a uh, junior member of your team that comes from, you know, you know, didn't go to school with you, went to some other sort of school, has crazy whacked out ideas that they're throwing under the table. And one out of every 50 is going to be worth looking at and considering. They're not realistic. They're not the answer, but they create a new space to explore. Yeah. They prompt your thinking. They get something happening. And that's a value, yeah. but it's not the answer. It's not a solution. It's a, it's a space to explore. I did an episode with Ben Guler from Evolve Lab, and they make the rendering application Verus, which is an AI rendering application yeah. for Rhino and Revit and Vectorworks and now Forma um, and ArchiCAD and SketchUp. I, so the 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 idea that that we talked about in there was that it's prompting us, and that's why I bring yeah. it up. It's it's like it is a feedback loop, right? And so one out of fifty isn't bad when you are in the design exploration stage yeah. because i mean that's this is what designers do like it's all a training model we are constantly mm -hmm. taking input from all over the place filing it away you don't know when you're going to use it and then the the opportunity presents itself you and creativity doesn't happen when you want it to it just happens right, right? we can't explain that but it's like we're connecting dots. That's what we do as designers. I, I love talking to you about this, Shane, because, and, and and maybe this is a total aside, but I think it is so important for somebody in your position to come from the practice side. I think that is so key because the things that you're talking about and and then you get into implementation and licensing and, and application right. and all of these things, but, but you're coming at it from a really pure place of like the pursuit of our craft. And that yeah. to me is so important. And there's, there's a lot of people out there like you who are in positions. And I just think like it is a huge advantage for firms to have somebody come from that perspective or that approach or that way of thinking about it um, because it's about architecture and you're constantly bringing yeah. it back to architecture. You're not just trying to solve this very narrow problem Sometimes that may be a narrow solution to a much larger piece of the puzzle, um, but you're looking at it at the puzzle scale, right? And and I think that that's, that's really cool. It's really interesting to think about the hit rate of of interesting things and that that mm. but that's what creativity is like it's it's funny that people want to throw up a red flag and like it makes mistakes it's like okay i make mistakes you make mistakes we all make mistakes <laughs> and sometimes the yeah. mistakes lead to unexpected outcomes surprising things 
that all of a sudden that's a new path that wasn't available to us before. Like Bob Ross, I've, the painter, said, happy little accidents, right? It's totally yeah. true when it comes to creativity. There's an aspect of cultural transformation that comes out of mistakes. So there was a debate mm-hmm. that we had uh, about six months ago, a, f- a playful debate that I was uh, organized in as part of the World City Conference. And it was a two teams pitted against each other around the role of the architect in urban design in a city. And one group, uh, not necessarily that they actually agreed with his perspective, but three people were picked to be, yes, it's AI is going to replace the architect. I was on the no AI isn't going to replace the architect side. And one of the arguments that we made was, because this presentation was in New York City, um, a, a, a an AI would want to create a city that was hyper-efficient, you know, as pure and as clean and as simple as possible. From scratch. But it would be com- you, you just got to start over. Right. You can't, you can't make would, a New York City. <laughs> right. right. It would be completely devoid of culture. It wouldn't right. have any depth. It wouldn't have meaning. There are all sorts of happy accidents, mm-hmm. to quote Bob Ross, that have been in the urban planning of New York City. Now, granted, a lot weren't happy accidents. They were very right. angry in accents in terms of, um, you know, bulldozing over portions of the Bronx and Brooklyn and, and disadvantaged neighborhoods. But there were other things that happened that were in the gaps, in the gray areas, in the mistakes, in the overlaps, in the oddities. Um, it, it's in the movement from one neighborhood to another, it, encountering one cultural group, butting up against another cultural group. Things that an AI would want to make more efficient and organize and more productive with a different, completely different set of goals, where we have actually appreciated those accidents and differences and what happens in a temporal quality over time, what changes mm-hmm. over time. Those mm-hmm. cultural changes do uh, are things that um, do happen in those gray spaces. And I think we as humans are very good at operating them. We're also very good at, because we're not a black box, people can have, a again, a theory mind about what others are thinking about. We can work with each other and make our way through these changes and make compromises and come up with solutions together. Um, those, again, are some of these unique qualities as humans we have. Uh, and I, I also just keep coming back to there's, you know, there's multiple types of intelligence that humans have. And those are the things that we have to end up bringing to the table. I do. Mm-hmm. Th- AI will absolutely be part of our work um, and it will be in multiple aspects of our work going forward. But we have to come back and ask the question, why are we doing this in the first place? What's the role of our practice? What's the role of our profession in the industry? Um, what's our role in society and how we interface with the people who are ultimately going to inhabit the spaces that we create? And it's their experience that we, be sh- we should be aiming for. So if there is a way for AI to help provide a more positive experience for them by helping us do some of our work, by maybe automating portions of our work so we can focus on that end user in the end, then absolutely we should do it. And my hope would be anybody leading strategy in a technology practice has to look at it from that kind of perspective, because that's ultimately your goal. It's not just to save money on your next contract with a large software vendor. We have to do that, yes, but in the end, the reason why you were there is to ultimately help the designers in that practice create transformational experiences for the people who live out in the built environment. That's yeah. that's your goal. If you help them get there, then you're successful. I kind of want to end the episode right there, but I get, I'm not going to. I want to just say that okay. like it's through failure that learning happens, right? And yeah. you cannot learn without failure. You're just going to be regurgitating the same old crap. I mean, that's one of my concerns with AI is that we're just going to keep regurgitating the same crap because it was trained on the Internet and there's a lot of crap. There's a lot of garbage in and garbage out. So I, I'm, I'm concerned about that. But but the idea of the imperfections in New York City, to your example, like there's something also to be said about it, that it is exactly perfect in all of its imperfections. Oh, yeah. Right. There's yeah. something amazing and beautiful. And there's these moments that could have ne- you could have never planned for those, right? And, and there's something really special about that. And that is what makes it incredibly human. Like to get back to the whole why we do what we do part of this, it's, it's for the people and to create experiences and to make their lives better so that they can better contribute back to society and their community and their families and all these things. Like architecture elevates the built environment and it has the ability to do that we literally it's so weird that this has come up three times in this episode but we literally can change the world right and yeah. we're concerned about so many things the the environmental impact and there, there's just so many layers to that the building code and health safety and welfare and the human experience and all of these things that it's it's just an incredible profession to work within and at the same time like we're so run down by all of this stuff that happens on the day-to-day basis on the distractions 
doing so much email, worrying about licensing and like all that's just getting in the way of us yeah. doing the thing that we're supposed to be doing that we actually can contribute to the world. And uh, I mean, this has been a wonderful conversation to have with you. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to hang out with us today. I'm really enjoying where things are going right now in the industry. And I, I really mm. appreciate that at least for us in our practice, but this is happening in lots of places, is the buzz around AI has focused the attention back on human experience and what we do as architects and what our role is. Mm -hmm. And I, I, in a way, I think people wanted that to happen when BIM came along, and mm -hmm. it didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, BIM kind of kicked the can down the road. It automated some things for us, but it didn't necessarily, uh, necessarily increase the maybe the quality of what was being delivered or the value which we are providing society. If anything, it kind of pointed towards how dependent we are on technology to actually deliver on parts of our work, all those right. additional drawing sets that we now had to create. Um, this is actually starting to ask the question, what is our value and what are we supposed to be providing? Um, I don't agree with some of the heads of technology companies who seem to think that on oh, five years, architects are going to disappear. It's, they don't understand what we actually provide. But I do think we as an industry have to step up and advocate for ourselves, but also really point out, you know, uh, where there are opportunities to use AI to then provide that kind of unique human value that we do uh, provide to the built in built environment. I guess this prompts me to ask you, uh, you know, maybe a, maybe a final question, but at Woods Bagot or maybe just in your head, have you started to think about changes in business model that are going to need to happen? Yeah, I think uh, a few things that have come up for us is we've been asking, okay, if we're if it's no longer just fee for services, we're not just counting the amount of hours that we're doing for the work. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to be the model of, uh, oh, the fee for that project is, well, I know it's going to take this many drawing sets. So, okay, that thick of a drawing set costs this amount of money, right? right? Those sort of models have to continue to disappear. It's not where our value is. They were an easy way for us to charge money. Maybe it's similar to what we said at the previous conversation uh, at the beginning about licensing. It's the easiest way for us to just have an answer of how much to charge, but right. it's not the value we're actually providing to the end product. Um, some of the things that come up um, have more to do with uh, building performance. So are there performance incentives? I know Phil Bernstein has talked about this, a handful of others. If your building performs 10 or 20 percent better than the metric, a particular metrics that were agreed upon in advance with the client, is there an incentive for us that we you know get more money associated out of that? Um, some of this comes down to then proving that through evidence-based design. So we've had increased amount of conversations about both environmental and building performance, but also social performance, getting into the social sciences and understanding how our spaces are performing and showing that value to clients. Um, it has caused us to talk a lot more about what our value is and how we might be partnering with our clients to uh, effectively get paid for what value we're actually bringing to them, their end product, where they want to have an amazing space for their employees or for the public or whatever it is. Um, I don't know that I necessarily have an answer, but it's something we're absolutely like very actively looking after right now. And there's some real questions as to whether it might be a multitude of answers, depending on the kind of service and the kind of sector that we're working with. What works for retail might be different from workplace and might be different from residential versus transport. But your leadership is open to having those conversations. And it's not like this yes. is definitely something that just keeps the can keeps getting kicked down the road. Right. It's like maybe someday we'll have to think about that. It's literally happening right now where the value yes. proposition yeah. has to be stated for what where we add value to the process. And I like what you're talking about, extending that into building performance over time. You talked about the temporal nature of like that projects don't stop when we when the occupancy happens, right? It continues. And therefore, I think there is a huge opportunity for us to continue to have a relationship with a client to ensure that that happens. Because the, the prototypical nature of buildings is just that like we, you have to prove it once the building yeah. is built. So this starts to lead into ideas about having a real research arm of a company as well. Because you can't just ask dumb questions. You're going to get dumb answers at the end. And and truly taking the time to understand empathetically like what clients are experiencing in spaces. Because if the, if you just send a form over the fence, they're just going to check boxes. They're, they're going to take the least path of resistance to get that form done because they're just being forced to do it. But actually sitting with those users, experiencing space, talking about operations, 
maintenance of facilities, all of these things that happen after occupancy is where now you're shifting the conversation to a, a later phase of service and relationship with clients potentially as well. We've had good luck with those conversations with a lot of repeat clients, clients mm -hmm. that we've done lots of work for. That's definitely happened that. in workplace yeah. um, and uh, some of our retail work. Um, but increasingly having those conversations with new clients coming in to say, you know, we don't, we're not just there to build you one space. Uh, we'd like to have an ongoing relationship with you. And our goal is through things like post occupancy analysis, through building and spatial simulation, all these things is to uh, take um, critical insights and turn them into thoughtful outputs. So the answers that we're providing, the directions that we're providing are based upon data and our constant learning of our work as we go from project to project. Yeah. And that's where this feedback loop with your GPT and your design intelligence yeah. could really benefit your firm over time. Because you're, if you're continually putting in high quality insights and things you're pulling from clients of projects, and that is generating the feedback loop for what's coming next, you could really see this stepping up over time. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, Shane, thank you so much for taking the time. This has been a fantastic conversation. I'll put links to where everybody can follow you online in the show notes. And uh, I appreciate it, man. This has been fun. Hey. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate you reaching out to me again. All right, until next time.